Hi. I remember very vividly when I decided that I wanted to become a historian when I grew up. It was 1986, and I was 13 years old. It was Christmas. And one of my Christmas gifts was a yellow paper with a computer printout. And the printout was information of different things that were happening around the time that I was born. And it included things like the price of milk and the price of gasoline, who won the World Series that year. And it had some government information as well. So I already knew that Richard Dixon was the president that year. And I saw that under vice president, it was blank. And initially, I just chalked it up to it being a computer glitch. But for whatever reason, it just really nagged at me that there were no other blanks on the paper except for vice president. So finally, the curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to look into it to make sure it really was a glitch. But as it turns out, Richard Nixon's first vice president, Spiro Agnew, had resigned on October 10th. I was born four days later, and there wasn't a new vice president until December 6th when Gerald Ford was sworn in. So I actually was born without a vice president. So that was the first historical mystery that I solved. And I learned that sometimes history throws you a curveball. And you think that there are going to be these patterns, and then it's all, all of a sudden there's not. So I always took that with me ever since I was 13. Now fast forward to 2002, and I've started teaching at St. Cloud State University, teaching ethnic studies courses. And one of the resources that I use online and still use today is a website called citydata.com. City and data have a hyphen in between. It's a website that has all sorts of information about different cities all across the country, including Minnesota. So a way that I try to get my students to think ethnically is to go to the website during class and to look at different cities and towns and to pay attention to the ethnic demographics. So I always start with St. Cloud and their demographics, and then I look at the Twin Cities. And then if students want to volunteer having me look up their hometown, then I do that. And there are some students who are really curious about their hometowns, but they're small towns, and so they often very apologetically preface by saying, I don't come from a very diverse town, but can you look this up for me? And I'll never forget, there was one time when I looked up somebody's hometown and the population was in the hundreds. And I think there were only one or two ethnic minority groups that were listed. And the website always has the percentages and then the hard numbers. And for African American, there had been this ridiculously small percentage, like 0.05% or something. And then under the hard number, it was one, as if, as if to say there was one African American in the town. And that student said, hey, I know the black guy in town. And it just went on from there. It was an interesting discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked my students, especially those who come from the small towns, why do you think your town is not very diverse? And more often than not, they'll say, well, I guess people of color just never made their way up there. It never dawns on them that there probably would have been indigenous people first who would have been forced off that land. But it also doesn't dawn on them that perhaps there were minorities, especially African-Americans who might have lived there but who might have either had to go back to the South or just go somewhere else, anywhere but that particular town. Case in point, around the same time that I arrived, a friend of mine who's African-American was giving a speech in St. Cloud. And after the speech, she allowed time for questions and comments. And she told me that there was this middle-aged woman who got up to make a comment. And the comment that this person said was, well, St. Cloud was just fine before you people got here. So when she told me this story, I just thought, well, when did we come here? Because my, I'm a historian, I just get curious about these things. <laughs> so all I had to do was crack open one book, and I found out that 
whereas this middle-aged woman was making it sound like African Americans came to town in the 1970s or 80s, they actually came to town in the 1850s and they came as slaves. So I realized two things from this. One, or one was that this person didn't know what she was talking about. And number two, it's another curveball because I had always thought that Minnesota was this legal free territory and legal free state. So how can there possibly be slaves? So that led me to another historical mystery that I've been trying to solve ever since. And I had mentioned yesterday that reading Ta-Nehisi Coates' 2014 article, The Case for Reparations in the Atlantic, inspired me to try to find as many connections, especially connections on paper between slave plantations in the South and people who live in Minnesota. And what I discovered was that I could use real estate deeds that were housed in recorder offices in counties all across Minnesota to find a paper trail almost right away. And after doing this for quite a few years in quite a few counties across Minnesota, what I found is that there were basically two types of slaveholders who would come to Minnesota. One type would be people who had maybe no more than one or two slaves back in the South, and they would come to live in Minnesota permanently, and they would either take those slaves with them, or they would keep them in the South with a family member. But the slaveholders themselves would live in Minnesota full time. The other type would be people who would only come to Minnesota temporarily. These tended to be people who had dozens or hundreds of slaves back in the South, and they may take one, two, or three slaves with them from the South to Minnesota, but they wouldn't stay in Minnesota full time. Best case scenario, they would probably stay for about a week. Uh, worst case, they would stay for six months, the whole summer, basically. And what I found in looking at the latter is that there were quite a few more of the temporary slaveholders than there were of the permanent ones. So I think that to talk about slavery in Minnesota is to talk about this constant repatriation because what's happening is that slaveholders are coming with their slaves from the south to Minnesota starting roughly in April and the last of the slaveholders who are still in Minnesota throughout the summer don't leave until about October. And there are some who actually stay for the whole spring and summer because they have that kind of time and they have that kind of money. But there are other temporary slaveholders who would come to Minnesota just to buy land and then they would leave. Now part of why they would only go in the spring and summer is twofold. Number one, for those of you who have never been in a southern state in the summer, it's really hot. So Minnesota was seen as a very attractive vacation spot for southerners because it was a lot cooler and still is in the spring and summertime. And with Minnesota being right by the Mississippi River, it would be very easy for people to travel up from Louisiana and Mississippi all the way to Minnesota and just stay there for however long they wanted to. The second reason is just a very practical um, climate kind of reason. You can only travel up the Mississippi River and down the Mississippi River when it's not frozen. And so April is when the river is pretty much thawed and the steamboats could travel up. And then they could stay until they started to worry about the river thaw uh, freezing up again in October. So April to October would be the tourism season every year. Minnesota was organized as a territory in 1849 and it did not become a state until 1858, and then legal slavery ends in 1865. So for most of the time that Minnesota exists before the end of the Civil War, it is a free territory. Now there's a 14 month period between the time of the Dred Scott decision of March of 1857 and the time that Minnesota becomes a free state in 1858 in May when Minnesota is legally a slave territory because the Dred Scott decision stipulated that a slaveholder could take a slave to any territory. It didn't matter whether it was 
above or below the 3630 parallel. So since Minnesota was still a territory at the time, Minnesota became a slave territory. Now, before 1857, there wasn't a whole lot of concern about Minnesota, Minnesotans having to deal with slavery because Southerners had already established that they didn't want to make it a permanent thing because of the climate and also because of the soil. It's just not fertile enough for plantation slavery to exist in Minnesota. And then you have legal slavery take place and there is this influx of slaveholders who come to Minnesota for tourism or to buy land. But then after Minnesota becomes a state, local people who thrive on the tourism industry have this conundrum. You know, what do you do with your clientele? Now that slavery is illegal in Minnesota, how are you gonna make it attractive for slaveholders to come back to Minnesota for the next tourism season? So what they try to do is to have this really twisted kind of legal rationale. And it kind of blames the slaves in a way because what they argue among themselves is that whenever a slaveholder brings a slave to Minnesota from 1858 onward, once that slave is in Minnesota, they are legally free. But there are very few, very substantial free communities outside of the Twin Cities there certainly is not one in St. Cloud at all. So there's not that much incentive for African-Americans who are now suddenly free in Minnesota to stay put. And you also have to look at what it is that the slaves are facing when they come here. Typically, it would be the wealthiest of the planters who would come to Minnesota, and they would choose one to three slaves of their plantation to go with them. So that would mean that there would be a lot of people that they would leave behind. So these slaves would have to say goodbye to their family and to their friends and anyone else in the slave community and travel with their slaveholder. Then they would have to be in Minnesota not knowing anybody and not seeing anybody who looked like them except in the Twin Cities. But then the only people who looked like them in the Twin Cities would be free people. And so there's no slave community in Minnesota for the slaves to try to bond with. So slaves generally went back to the South with their masters when September and October rolled around. And so Minnesotans would say, well, if slaves are choosing to go back to the South even though they're free, that's on them. And Minnesotans would not go out of their way to disturb the relationship between master and slave in Minnesota even though such a relationship would have been illegal from 1858 onward. So what I wanted to know after reading Tanakasi Coates' article was what it meant for reparations for Minnesota slaves or when it comes to Minnesota slaves. And one thing that I thought should happen is that whatever companies and whatever institutions benefited from having the presence of slavery should say so. They should say so on their websites. They should say so in brochures that they hand out to people who want to visit the companies or the institutions. Another thing that could happen or that should happen is that there should be some kind of acknowledgement that there was a presence of slaves in their towns. And I'm happy to say that St. Cloud has actually been a leader in that because the mayor of St. Cloud, Dave Kleiss, was interested in research that I had done about local slavery, which I've been doing for about a decade now. And a couple of years ago, he created a new park for the city and he decided that he wanted to name it after a couple of people who were kept in St. Cloud as slaves. And this was something that he did on his own. There was nothing that I had to do with it. The only thing that he asked me to do was to write the text for the historical marker that went by the park and to make sure that the information on that sign was accurate, which I did. And so in May of 2017, the park was dedicated and it's the only park that I know of, at least in central Minnesota, if not all of Minnesota, that's named after slaves. <laughs>
Now, since there was a tourism industry all along the Mississippi River, you can make a case that you could have historical markers all the way up and down the Mississippi River, at least in Minnesota, to say where certain slaves were kept and what they did while they lived here. And the final thing that I wanted to do was to make sure that I had as many names of slaves as possible because whenever I would try to find the names of slaves, I started at newspapers first. And for a while, St. Cloud actually had the names of slaves, not the names of slaves, I'm sorry, but they would have the names of slaveholders. And then by the name of the slaveholder, who was a guest at a hotel, it would say, and servant or and two servants. And then about last year when I went to the Hennepin History Museum, they have in their archives the guest book of a hotel that used to be in the Twin Cities. And they did the same thing. It had so and so and servant or and three servants. So what I tried to do was to look and see in the 1870 census if there were people who would have been slaves 10 years earlier in 1860. And if I found matches, then I would make a note of it. And I finally had enough information that I felt comfortable making a website out of it. And if I can bring it up, that website is called The Slaves Who Made Minnesota. So here it is. The slaves who made Minnesota, African Americans kept in slavery by Southerners owning real estate in Minnesota from 1849 to 1865. As I mentioned, I went to recorder's offices all across Minnesota, especially up and down the Mississippi River. And what I would do is look at the real estate deeds from before 1865. I'd write down all the names of the Southerners who bought real estate. And then I would go home and go to ancestry.com or to familysearch.org. And then I would try to see if any of the people whose names I'd written down owned slaves based on either slave schedules or probate court records. And if they did, then I would put the name of the slaveholder on the website. And from there, I would try to find the names of slaves. So. What I would try to do in that regard was to look at the names of I'm sorry, the names of free African Americans in 1870 who have the same last name as the slaveholder that's on the website. And then I would look at the slave schedule of 1860, which would only be under the name of the slaveholder. And then I would try to see if I can find a match in terms of gender and color, either black or what they called mulatto back then, and age, and see if the gender, color, and age match any gender, color, and age of the free people who have names in 1870. And if I found matches, then I would list them under the name of the slaveholder. So in the time that I have left, I thought that I would share some of the things that I found with some of the people from St. Cloud and elsewhere. Let's see. So one person I found in Stearns County was a man named Thompson Anderson. And he purchased two lots from the mayor of St. Cloud, S.B. Lowry, in 1857. Mr. Anderson was from Nashville, Tennessee, and in 1860, he held six slaves in Tennessee while he owned this land in St. Cloud. And he was the co-owner of Allison Anderson and Company, and he worked for an insurance company that insured slaves in transit. And the only name I've been able to find so far that is a possible match is a slave by the name of Horace. <laughs> 
next. We have John Fight Goodner, who also bought land in St. Cloud. He bought uh, four lots. He was originally from Tennessee, and he fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And he actually still owned land in St. Cloud while he was a Confederate soldier. And that was fairly common in St. Cloud, at least among the slaveholders, for them to still hold on to their property while fighting in the Civil War. So in, in Stearns County and in counties throughout Minnesota, there were quite a few pieces of real estate that actually belonged to the official enemy, if you will. And speaking of Confederates, Robert Carruthers, um, he bought quite a bit of land in Benton County and Stearns County. He owned the most land out of any southerner in Stearns County. For any of you who are familiar with the St. Cloud Hospital, the southerners tended to buy land in that part of St. Cloud, the northern part of the city. So Carruthers was originally from the town of Lebanon in Wilson County, and he held slaves in Tennessee, but he also co-owned a plantation in Yazoo County, Mississippi, and that plantation had over a hundred slaves. So he was tremendously wealthy. And after I put this online, I later learned that Carruthers was actually elected the Confederate governor of Tennessee during the Civil War in 1863. But by then the Union had conquered quite a bit of the state, so Carruthers never actually got to serve a day in office. But while he was the governor of Confederate Tennessee, he still owned all that land in Stearns County. And these are some of the names of the slaves that I've been able to find. From Governor Carruthers. Now I had mentioned that some of the slaveholders owned only about one or two slaves and they lived here full time. So one of those people There's a man by the name of Harwood Eagleheart. Oh, there he is. And ever since moving here, Eagleheart became really interested in real estate. He bought the eastern half of the Payne Phelan neighborhood, 10 acre blocks three miles from St. Paul, lot eight of block 18 on Robert Street, and Eagleheart Street, which is now Eagleheart Avenue in Ramsey County. And with two other people from his home state of Maryland, uh, Charles McCubbin and William Sprigg Hall, Harwood Eagleheart bought quite a bit of real estate. And for those of you who are familiar with St. Paul, the streets that are named after southern flowers like Magnolia and Hyacinth, um, all those were developed by Eagleheart, who originally owned the property. And his father kept his slave in Maryland while he lived here, and that slave's name was Rosetta Johnson. One of the co-owners of the land with Eagleheart was William Sprigg Hall, who was one of the first judges in Minnesota. So before he lived in Minnesota, he lived in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. He inherited slaves during his childhood, after his father passed away, and he collected money on them well into his adult years. And then I have a link to a webpage in which he has a lawsuit in 1852 in order to collect more money on his slaves because he wanted to use the interest money to pay his way through law school, which he ultimately did. So that is how one of Minnesota's first judges 
became a judge, or at least became educated about the law. Now, last but not least, I'll look at people who are connected to the U of M, since that's where we are. I had mentioned yesterday that some of the people who are the early champions of the U of M, like Henry Rice and Henry Sibley, were people who had been employees of the American Fur Company. And the American Fur Company was co-owned by three or four people based out of St. Louis. And one of those people was John Sanford, and John Sanford was the owner of Dred Scott. He's the Sanford of Dred Scott versus Sanford. So when I found out about that last year, I added him to the page. So he owned land in Minnesota. He was incorporator of the St. Anthony Falls Water Company. And of course, uh, he was the boss of a couple of people who helped make the U of M happen. And then there's Tred Scott's name there. One of the first trustees of the U of M was another person out of Maryland by the name of John Nichols. He inherited slaves from his father, but he wanted to free them as soon as he could. And, and so he did, not too long after he arrived in Minnesota. So the two slaves that he inherited that he freed were a woman by the name of Margaret Downs and then a man by the name of Alexander Ross. And then we have William Aiken, who was a governor and a congressman from South Carolina. He held 700 to 800 slaves in Charleston. And in 1856, he made a $15,000 loan to the U of M, which was closed at the time, but thanks to his loan was able to reopen. And in 1857, he returned to Minnesota to cash out some of that loan, about half of it. So that left between $7,000 to $8,000 in the U of M's accounts. And in 1862, Minnesota passed the Rebellion Act, which said that no Confederate could sue in Minnesota courts. So if Aiken wanted to get his money back, he couldn't. And the U of M has kept the money ever since. So since there were 700 to 800 slaves, I've been able to find the most names through Aiken. For extra credit, I have my students try to see if they can find names too. So that explains the different names of SCSU students you see here. Now, I know that I've primarily talked about Stearns County and Ramsey County and Hennepin County, but my findings are certainly not restricted to those particular counties. In Sherburn County, for example, there's Darius Starbuck, who owned quite a bit of land in Big Lake. And I mean, I find quite a few names of his slaves. All the way in Scott County, we have Henry Spain. And he owned land in Belle Plaine. And he was originally from Virginia. And perhaps one of the most important names that I've found overall was this man, Joseph Travis Rosser. Now, back when Minnesota was a territory, 
people would not be able to elect their own governor of the territory. The governor was always appointed by the president. So whatever political affiliation the president of the United States had, the governor would have too. And at the time, the president was a Democrat by the name of Franklin Pierce. And so it was President Pierce who appointed Joseph Travis Rosser to be the lieutenant governor of Minnesota territory. Rosser was from Virginia. And once he moved here, he bought land in Ramsey County. And he also was one of the developers of St. Peter in Nicolette County. Back then, the office of Lieutenant Governor was called the Secretary of the Territory, but it was still the same office. Every now and then, the person who was the actual governor of Minnesota would have to go out of town or out of state on business. So that meant that in the governor's absence, the territorial secretary would become the governor. And I've been able to find documents in which Rosser signs on behalf of the office of the governor. So from 1853 until James Buchanan became president and appointed somebody else in 1857, Minnesota had someone in its government who was one heartbeat away from being the governor, but who was a slaveholder. I haven't been able to find any names of his slaves, but lots of documentation that he had them. And so this is what reparations looks like to me, to have slavery be front and center of discussions and to have as many names of people as possible and to have their stories and to know that it doesn't necessarily matter if you come from a small town, but that slavery is pretty much inescapable from Minnesota's development. Thank you. <laughs>